Hello and welcome to this live stream with me. I'm hoping that we are now on air. Um, I'm going to have a quick check uh, be behind me to make sure that we're live. Look at that, we're live. I can see myself. Fabulous. So, hello and welcome, uh, as I say, to this Canon Live here in... Um, yep, we are still in my kitchen. We're still in lockdown. Um, on the Cons Cameras Facebook page. Um, hit up the comments very quickly. Let me know you're here, if indeed you are here. Uh, and I will do my best to uh, answer them, uh, or to at least see them. They're going to be down here. Uh, so, who am I, for a start? My name's Dave Newton. Some of you may know me from workshops that I've run uh, at Cons before. Uh, I'm hoping someone is watching. He'll know who he is. Yes, I do need a haircut. This is lockdown hair. Many thanks for pointing it out, Brian. Um, so, uh, today, over the next hour, uh, the plan is that I am going to talk to you all about speed light flash, all about these little things, okay? Uh, now, I am a big, big fan of speed light flash. I use it in all of my work. Uh, in fact, pretty much all of my uh, flash work is done with speed lights. I very, very rarely use anything else. Uh, and what I've learned over the years uh, is that people tend to fall into one of two camps. They're either ambient light only photographers, which is code for I don't know how to use flash, or they've discovered flash and the brilliance that it can bring to images uh, and they'll never go back. That doesn't mean that it's the only way. Obviously, sometimes you're going to shoot ambient, sometimes you can shoot flash, sometimes you're going to mix them. The truth is that using flash is actually really, really simple. There's just a few basic things you need to understand, and if you get your head around those, uh, then all is well. Uh, you will be on your way to being a flash master in no time at all. So what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to give you a very quick tour of uh, the setup that we have here so that you can see what's going on. Obviously, uh, we have a camera here. Uh, oh, good. There's some comments. Good morning, everyone. Paula. Uh, Aaron Prasad, uh, Kira, hello, um, Connor, fabulous, uh, Robert Spencer from Dubai, wow, hello there. Uh, okay, so I'm going to give you a quick tour of what we've got going on here. Obviously, we have a camera here where you can see me, not super exciting, not overly uh, fun to watch. So we also have uh, a camera over here, that's this one over here, okay, uh, that's going to allow you to see what I've got going on down here, what I'm photographing, um, camera, flash guns, backgrounds, or all of that jazz. Um, in case that wasn't a particularly good angle for you, we've got this one down here, hello, uh, where I can uh, talk to that one and you can kind of see a reverse view. Uh, and then finally, the one that we're going to move to right now, uh, we have my computer screen. Uh, and the reason we have my computer screen is that it's going to allow you to A, uh, C, uh, some uh, pictures as I take them, but also for me to give you a little presentation uh, to begin to tell you how and why I use Flash uh, and why I think it is uh, fantastic. So, um, it's all well and good seeing a screen, but you probably have to see me as well, so hello there, otherwise it feels like you're just staring at a screen. Uh, so, you've got me too. Uh, it means I'm talking just to you, okay? Never mind the other 48 people that are online, I am talking solely to you right now, okay? Uh, so, let's begin, uh, and I'm going to start by showing you some pictures, all of which use flash. Um, so, we have got um, here some, some flash mixed with ambient light. Um, flash can be used for all sorts of subjects. Today, we're going to be using it for macro. Uh, it really doesn't matter. The principles of using flash are the same. Um, so here, obviously, uh, it's used for a portrait, for a fashion shoot, uh, and it has been mixed with ambient light, but it's super subtle, to the point that you would probably not necessarily think that flash had been used. Um, it can be a little bit more obvious. Here, we've again mixed it with ambient light, um, but it's a little bit stronger. We, we instinctively know that there's some lighting on our model. Uh, it's not uh, totally natural, if you like. I mean, she looks natural, the background look na looks natural, but she looks superimposed, and, and that's obviously a, a telltale giveaway that we've used some form of lighting. Uh, so here, for example, she was, uh, she was positioned under, uh, it was like a wooden structure, like a, a house in the woods. Uh, the background, all that light in the background is smoke in a woodland, and that's just natural light coming through the trees. Uh, and then I've um, put light onto her to try and brighten her up so that she's not a complete silhouette. 
Um, it can be very much more obvious. Now this is, uh, this is in the French Alps on location. That's Mont Blanc in the background, high above the Chamonix Valley. Uh, and this guy is running, obviously. Uh, and um, here I've used flash again to stop him being a silhouette. If you look in front of him, uh, you can see the shadow on the ground that's obviously coming from the sun that's behind him. Um, he would have been just a hard silhouette uh, without any light. So speed light flash in the foreground to light him up just gives him uh, that little bit of uh, zing and pop and, and makes us able to see him. Um, it can be very dramatic. Action sports, this lunatic um, uh, was a guy that I was uh, filming and photographing and he was jumping from one rock stack to another on his bike. Uh, it's about, I don't know, there's about a 30 foot high rock stack, so death uh, would entail if he missed it, but he was quite happy to do that a couple of times. Uh, and that also is lit with speed light flash. Um, so it's high speed sync, which is something we can talk about in a while. Uh, and it is, um, obviously he's moving. It's quite a long way away, but it is speed lights. It's not studio lights. Um, I used several speed lights. So there were four of them all ganged together in one group. If you'd like to know more about that, hit up the comments. Uh, and I will uh, do my best to answer them. Uh, okay, I'm just having a quick look. Uh, uh, I'm just having a quick look here to see if there are any comments coming in. Uh, there are a couple. Uh, okay, but no questions yet. Right, so what I do need to tell you at this point is that because it's live, you can ask questions uh, and I will do my best to see them. It will mean I have to keep looking down here at, uh, at the iPad, uh, but I will do my best to see them and answer them. Okay, moving on. Uh, it can be used in a landscape. Now again, this is, um, uh, this is uh, an action picture in that there is somebody cycling, but it's fundamentally a landscape. Uh, and I've used flash to highlight certain areas of that scene to make sure that I've got the lighting looking just how I want it to be. So use it in landscapes as well. This is not just a macro or portrait thing. Think a bit more laterally, a bit wider. Think about where else you may be able to use flash to highlight certain aspects of your scene. Um, it can be used in the studio, obviously, portrait, abstract, um, this was uh, a portable studio. In fact, some of you may have even been there when this was taken, because uh, this was taken at, uh, I want to say, the Photovision Roadshow at Croke Park uh, a few years back now, um, where I was giving a demo all about Speedlight Flash. So um, I'm hoping if you saw this shoot happen live, then most of what I might say today should be familiar to you. But if not, then it'll be a great refresher. Uh, or uh, it can be used on location. I've already shown you some location stuff, but this is just a single flash off camera in the Maasai Mara, uh, allowing me to light up uh, this Maasai lady um, against the background again, so she's not a silhouette. It can be used to just highlight parts of your scene. So it's not necessarily about lighting the whole thing. Uh, it's about picking out certain parts of, of the scene that you, uh, you want to highlight. And um, if you look, this guy, this, this model Nick, he has got a great profile. Uh, so it seems sensible to try and highlight him um, with a bit of a backlight. The one thing I'll say about this is that positioning of light is crucial. Obviously, we're going to talk about how you get the right amount of light, but your positioning is crucial too. Um, if you notice on both of these pictures, the, in theory, unlit side of his face, both have a little bit of light on his eye. Okay? They're the eyes are just picked up. If they'd just gone black, if there was no light on those eyes, then that side of the face would be dead and flat, uh, and you would find that it, it, it didn't look amazing. It would, it would lack depth. Uh, it would lack empathy with your subject. So you have to really think about where you are positioning your light as well as how much you're going to get from it. Uh, and finally, uh, light could be everything in your scene um, in the sense that speed lights could be everything in your scene. Uh, you can have multiple speed lights as we've got here. There's uh, at least three, uh, three light groups going on in that um, to entirely sculpt the scene the way you want it to look. So with all of that said, uh, there are a couple of basics that we need to get to understand. I've already said I'm a big fan of flash. As far as I'm concerned, they're like little pocket suns. Uh, but the key thing that we need to know is how we get the right amount of light. Uh, and we can't uh, work out how we get the right amount of light until we know how we're going to use flash, what we're going to try and achieve. So there is a bit of a delay issue going on here. 
Um, there is a little bit of a, a, a delay going on here because I am going to um, I'm going to ask you questions. There's probably going to be about a minute or so, I guess, uh, between um, uh, b between like you seeing it and therefore you being able to comment. But I'm going to try and ask you questions, and I'll try and stall long enough to give you a chance to to answer. So. Let's have a little chat about Flash basics, okay? The basics of Flash. What do you need to know? So, there are, there are two types of Flash, or two methods of using Flash. And I'm wondering if anyone out there can tell me what they are. Can you tell me what those two types of Flash are? And I'm gonna watch the comments, uh, and I'm going to keep chatting away, and I'm going to say good morning to a few people. Paul, Brian, Garrett, Billy, uh, Emily, Colm, Barbara, hello everybody. And wow, uh, Eugene, thanks so much for, for joining uh, and uh, for commenting. Uh, there we go. Apologies, it would seem that there was a bit of buffering going on. Uh, I don't know if that was my end or, or Facebook end or, or somewhere in the middle, um, but hopefully it has settled down. Um, I'm recording this stream, so what I'll do is, when it's all done, if there's been any dropouts, if it doesn't show cleanly, um, I've got a cache running this side, which should hopefully um, fill it in. Uh, but if there's any bits that are missed, fire up the comments, let me know, uh, and I can make the recording of this video uh, available to you, um, or I'll send it to cons and, and they can make it available. So, uh, any, no answers, right, so. The two basic types of flash, uh, I think our delay is probably a little bit too long. The two basic types of flash I'm going to crack on and tell you are, uh, number one, where flash is dominant. Okay, This is where flash is all or most of the light in your scene. I, you're not really recording much ambient light. You are providing all of the light for that picture. Okay, So that's flash dominant. If that's number one, Hopefully, you're all shouting at your computer screen right now, or your phone, or your tablet, or however you're watching this, and going, the other one, Dave, is obviously fill-in flash. That's what it is. So, you've seen examples of both of them. I've shown you these pictures already. Flash is filling in the shadows caused by ambient light. So, let's, uh, let's for example, think that we are outside. Uh, we're outside taking a picture, uh, and the light is coming from the sun, uh, which is above us. Uh, and we know that when the light comes from above us, it creates shadows under the eyes, the nose, and the chin. Uh, it's not super flattering. It's also quite a hard light. Uh, hard and soft light is something we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and therefore, if you've got that hard light, those shadows that are very unflattering and unsightly, uh, you want to do something about it. And this is where flash helps, because you can put light into those shadows to even them off, to soften them up, so that they're not quite so distracting in your picture. In fact, flash is very much like a reflector but it's a reflector you can control. If you're going to use a reflector, you have to fit it into a certain place. Yeah, it's got to be here to bounce the light back there. If you're using flash, you can put the light wherever you want to fill in those shadows, okay? So, like a reflector, but way more versatile. Okay, so we've got flash dominant and we've got fill flash. And whichever one of these two we're going to do, we have to decide right at the start, because it will affect the way we are going to work with Flash. And it's going to affect the way that Flash behaves. Okay, So step one, decide if you want Flash to be all of the light in your scene, or you want to be mixing Flash with your ambient. Any comments? Oh, there were a few, a few comments, but none of you got it right. None of you got it right. But some good guesses, though. Some good guesses. Okay. So, moving on from the basics of Flash, we're going to talk about the shooting modes, okay? So, the shooting modes are things like P, T, V, A, V, and M, uh, and uh, obviously you'll probably use one or, or a collection of those, depending on what you're shooting, uh, and the mode that you choose to shoot in, again, will affect the way that Flash works, okay? It will change the look of your picture, depending on which of those modes you're in. So, let's start with, uh, with P for professional, sorry, program. I always get that wrong. P for program, that's the one. Um, P can sometimes be fill flash, and sometimes it's flash dominant. And what determines this is whether you have a lot of ambient light or not. So if you go outside, bright sunny day, lots of ambient light, 
Uh, the shutter speed is going to be whatever it needs to be uh, and you're going to have ambient light in your scene and flash is just going to fill in those shadows. But when we go inside and the light levels drop, uh, the, uh, the um, camera says, okay, you're in P mode, that means you might need a bit of a helping hand. Perhaps you haven't quite got your head around what you're trying to do. So what I'm going to do for you is make sure that your shutter speed is no slower than 1 60th of a second. On the basis that probably, unless you're using a super long lens, probably that's going to be reasonably sharp for you. We're going to avoid most of the camera shake. So no slower than a 60th of a second. Well, that's great. But if you're inside where there's low light levels, then a 60th of a second is not going to go very far to recording much ambient light. So you'll likely find that the flash will light the subject, subject will look nicely exposed, but the background will be underexposed. In other words, it's going to look flashy. It's going to be quite contrasty, dark background, bright subject, um, and potentially not the look that you're going for. Okay? So that's what P mode is going to do. Remember, program sometimes still flash, sometimes flash dominant, depending on how much ambient light you've got. Obviously, if you're in low light environment and you turn your ISO up, that will allow you to record more ambient light. It will also have the knock-on effect of meaning the flash doesn't have to work as hard. Uh, so that may be one way of forcing program mode into a bit more of a fill flash scenario because you're going to have more ambient light recorded. Okay, next up, we've got TV and we have got AV. Uh, so shutter priority and aperture priority. Now these do fill flash. Okay, They approach it from different directions but fundamentally they're doing fill flash. In other words, they're going to try and record the appropriate amount of ambient light such that the uh, flash to ambient ratio looks balanced. Okay. Now, hands up if you've ever shot with flash in AV mode in a low light environment. If so, did you happen to notice that the shutter speed got really, really slow? Uh, because if you did, uh, if you did, uh, someone got my joke, thanks Tom, Douglas, well done professional, ha ha ha, yes. Um, if you did, um, uh, if, if you have done that, if you've used AV mode in a low light environment uh, and seen your shutter speed go slow, it's because the camera is trying to record as much ambient light as it can to make it balanced. Well, if you're at F16 at ISO 100 and there's not much ambient light, what exactly did you think was going to happen? it's going to give you a very slow shutter speed because in AV mode, the shutter speed can go all the way down to 30 seconds if that's what it needs. Uh, and that means you might end up with some kind of weird swirly lines uh, of the background light, uh, but a sharp subject that's lit with flash. Okay, TV mode does the same thing, but the other way up. Um, in other words, it, it basically, um, excuse me, my puppy I think is gonna walk through. He's not, he's been caught. Um, the trouble with doing things at home, right? Working from home, um, puppies and, and children just appear out of nowhere. Um, so uh, in TV mode, what happens is your camera, again, is going to try and give you the appropriate shutter speed. What you may find is that the shutter speed flashes when you're looking at it through the viewfinder. What the camera is saying here is not you can't take a picture. It's saying I can't give you an appropriate shutter speed to record the correct amount of ambient light. Take the picture by all means, it's just not going to be properly balanced, okay? Uh, so that's TV mode, but again, it's still going to try and give you uh, that fill flash result. Uh, and then finally, we've got manual, okay? And in manual, you get to choose the ratio between flash and ambient light. So, what does that mean? Well, hopefully, from everything I've already said, you can have the cogs whirring in your brain going, well, if I want to control the ambient light, there's a setting that's going to do that for me, and that setting is, Q you furiously typing, uh, da, 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 da. no, nobody's going to get there in time. Okay, Q you furiously typing, shutter speed. The shutter speed controls how much ambient light you're going to record in your picture. If you have a very slow shutter speed, you'll record more ambient light. If you have a fast shutter speed, you will record less ambient light. So think about that, remember that, uh, and from there you can decide whether it's going to be full flash, flash dominant that we talked about before, in other words you're probably using a fairly fast shutter speed, or there's very little ambient light, 
or it's going to be fill flash here, in which case you're using a slower shutter speed. That doesn't necessarily mean 10 seconds, just slow enough to record whatever ambient light is there. Now, yes, I know ISO will also have an effect. I already mentioned this. If you turn your ISO up, you get more ambient light. If you turn it down, you get less. And again, it makes your flash work more or less hard, depending on whether it's higher or lower. Um, but fundamentally, keep in mind, shutter speed controls your ambient light exposure. Slower shutter speed, more ambient light. Probably looks less flashy because your balance between ambient and flash is, is more even. Uh, slower shutter speed, less ambient light, probably looks a bit more flashy because you've underexposed the background. Now, here's the tip. If you're going to do fill flash, if you get your ambient light meter incorrect, fill flash becomes quite simple. Okay, uh, And the reason that this is important is if you imagine that you're taking a picture of something and I'm going to reach for something now. Here we go. Brilliant. Something black. Like this, okay. This is a this is a, a, a case for a flash modifier that I'll talk about in a while. Um, if you uh, take a picture of something black in ambient light and you're letting the camera deal with the metering, what do we expect is going to happen to this? It's going to be overexposed because the camera wants everything to be a mid-tone grey. That means this isn't going to be black. It's going to be some grey level, okay? Well, if you've overexposed your ambient light and then you add flash to it, what? In which world do you think that's going to get better? It won't. It's just going to get brighter because you've got more light and you're adding extra light to it. Okay. So if you're already overexposing, flash is not a fix. We have to remember that cameras are fundamentally dumb in that they can't tell the difference between shadows and highlights. They want everything to be some version of mid-tone grey. Equally, if you underexpose your ambient light, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a bad picture, but we're going to be in that situation where flash becomes more dominant. We'll put that down. Uh, where flash becomes more dominant, uh, and therefore it's going to look more flashy. You're likely to have that darker background uh, with um, a bit more flash to it. Okay. So think about your ambient light first, uh, and then add in the flash. Any more questions? Uh, no, not yet. Right. Okay, moving on. We need to talk about compensation. Okay. Now, this is not an American uh, lawyer compensation thing. Uh, this is uh, purely and simply um, the, the compensation of how much light is coming into the camera. And there are two types of compensation that you can get. Um, there is ambient light exposure compensation commonly called exposure compensation. You find that on the back of your camera. Uh, and there is also flash exposure compensation. Now, these two are not the same thing. You can use them together, but they affect different parts of the image. Because when you're taking a picture with flash, you're effectively taking two pictures, one with whatever ambient light is there or not, uh, and one with whatever flash you're putting into the scene. So ambient exposure compensation is going to affect how much ambient light there is. The clue's in the name, right? Um, so if you're not in manual, if you're in AV or TV, uh, and you're photographing something that is darker than a mid-tone, that, that black thing that I showed you before, then you know that you need to use negative flash exposure compensation, uh, sorry, negative exposure compensation for your ambient light. You need to turn it down, otherwise it's going to have too much ambient light in the scene. Remember that mnemonic. If it's light, go right. Works beautifully. Uh, and we remember it that way because if it's dark, go left is a horrible rhyme that no one will remember. So if it's bright, go right. That means if it's brighter than a mid-tone, you're going to go to the right on your exposure scale. If it's darker than a mid-tone, you're going to go to the left on your exposure scale. So that's your ambient exposure compensation. And then it should hopefully come as no surprise to you that if you have um, flash on the camera, the metering is done in the same place i.e. in the camera. That's what ETTL means. Uh, in fact, someone mentioned ETTL down there. Can you, while I'm still talking, can anyone tell me without Google what ETTL stands for? Uh, and I'll keep yabbering on for a while and check the comments in a little bit. So what does ETTL stand for? And I don't just want the TTL bit. I need the E as well. That's the important part. So your flash metering is done in the camera. 
And that means that just because you're using flash, the camera still can't tell the difference between those shadows and highlights. It still wants everything to be a mid-tone grey. So once again, if we take our, our black bag that we're photographing, uh, we're likely to end up with the flash being overexposed. I was waiting for comments, but there's obviously nobody there. Uh, so it's likely to be overexposed. It's going to give it too much light. So again, we would use negative flash exposure compensation uh, to sort it out. So uh, having talked about flash exposure compensation, uh, I'm going to cut to a different camera, uh, which is going to be this one here, and I'm going to show you uh, where we do that. Oh, we've had some comments. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, through the lens, I said, I want more than just the TTL, Emily. Uh, Jerry, electronic, no. Um, confusation, love it. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, flash exposure compensation and where we find it. So right here, uh, and I'm hoping you can see this, uh, there's a light on it, so I'm going to stand here and, and you can hopefully see what's going on. This is a Speedlight 600EX, okay? Um, so this is, um, I, I have a bundle of these, favourite flash guns, they're brilliant. Um, so what we're going to be looking for is this button here, which has the plus minus. Uh, yeah, I'm making sure you can still see this, brilliant. And you see that when I've pushed that, we've got a plus minus in the screen and a zero. Uh, and if I now turn this dial, I can turn it to the right up to three stops, or I can turn it back the other way down to the left. This is flash exposure compensation, okay? Push the set button to set it. We can also do this in the camera, so we could use the camera's menu, or if you are using something like this, which is what we're going to talk about in a wee while, uh, this is an ST3RT, it's a radio transmitter for the flash guns. Uh, again, same deal, you see we've got a plus minus here, I can turn this to the right, I can turn it to the left, and that's going to affect our flash exposure compensation. Now, if you don't have the dial, let's say uh, you're on one of the other flash guns, some of them will just have um, a series of, uh, some of them will just have a series of uh, buttons, so you might just have to push the plus minus and then push the left or right buttons rather than having the dial. Same deal. If you're confused, then you can always default to finding it, hopefully, in your camera menu. Uh, it's usually in the red menus under speed light control or flash control, uh, and you would be able to set it there as well. So multiple places for you to set your flash exposure compensation. Okay? So, uh, did anyone get it right, by the way? Da-da-da-da. Uh, Da-da-da-da. Uh, uh, exposure. Uh, exposure. No one got it. Okay. Uh, I have to say, apologies for the low-flying aircraft. I have to say that I am, uh, I'm glad that nobody Googled it, clearly. Uh, the answer is evaluative. It's evaluative through the lens, okay? ETTL, evaluative through the lens metering. And what that means, hopefully your brain's going, oh, I've heard of evaluative before. That's our metering pattern, right? Cameras measure light in different ways. Uh, so we've got evaluative, uh, we've got spot, we've got center-weighted average, uh, and we've got partial. There are four uh, metering methods. And flash, unless you do something very tricky, flash uses evaluative. Even if your camera is set to spot metering, you're still going to use evaluative for your flash metering. Okay. Uh, so um, what that means is the camera looks at the whole scene. It tries to evaluate where the uh, subject might be. It evaluates the light across a multitude of zones, averages them all out. Uh, and then tries to work out some level of shadow and highlight and what the average exposure might be. It's all well and good. Doesn't always work. It's why we have other metering uh, patterns as well. Uh, it's up to you which you use. Um, it, as long as you understand what the camera is trying to do, it doesn't matter. You can get the same results with all four of them, provided you understand how they're working. Okay. So, now that we've got uh, ETTL sorted, what you need to know... Uh, and unfortunately, it, it won't show up on video because it'll miss. But in real life, if I showed you this, you probably wouldn't see it either. Um, when you take a picture with ETTL, the flash fires twice. Okay, now, you've probably never seen it. Some people might have seen it if you've done something very specific. Uh, but fundamentally, you've probably never seen that the flash fires twice. Now, why does it do that? Uh, more importantly, what benefit does it have? Well... The whole through the lens metering um, 
follows a bit of a timeline. There is a nice process the camera has to go through for you to be able to take a picture with flash. So when you half press the shutter button, the camera does a couple of things. First off, it measures the light. Then it does some focusing. And it takes that light measurement and it stores it, keeps it here. It's not overly important, uh, but it's got it. Then, when you fully press the shutter button, it remeasures the light. And this is actually crucial um, and uh, has been the case since ev on every Canon camera since the 20D, which was when ETTL2 was introduced. Um, basically, the reason it does it again is, let's imagine you're photographing a wedding, you've got a bride and groom, the bride's in a beautiful white dress, the groom's in a lovely dark suit. Um, you're going to focus on the bride, which means you may turn the camera slightly towards the bride, half press the shutter button to focus lock, and then recompose. If it used the exposure from that framing, it could be quite different from when you've got both bride and groom in the scene. So when you fully press the shutter button, the camera takes another ambient light reading. This timeline from now, for about the next minute, is about how long it's gonna take me to explain it, is very, very important. So, so make a note of this in your mind. It takes an ambient light reading it stores that ambient light reading, keeps it, puts it in its pocket. That's given it its base reading as to how much light there is in the scene. It then fires a pre-flash, and the pre-flash is fired at a 30 second power. It's quite an important number, you don't necessarily need to remember it though. So it fires a pre-flash at a 30 second power. And what happens is that pre-flash fires out, hits the subject, bounces back in through the lens, and is measured again by the camera. So the camera takes another exposure reading. But now it has a combination of both ambient light and flash. Because just because it's fired the flash doesn't mean it's able to turn off the ambient. So it's got a combination of two. Well, remember we already had an ambient only reading and now we've got a combined. If we subtract this from this, yeah, if the ambient gets subtracted from the flash, the camera can work out what component of the new meter reading came from flash. It also looks for a difference. So if we have a subject that's here uh, and then I'm in the background, I'm closer to where the flash is, so more light's going to return because we know flash falls off over distance. Uh, and the camera can go, oh, okay, well, more light's bouncing back from here. That's closer to the camera. That must be the subject. So if that's the subject, um, that's the distance that I need to set my exposure for. Because if it set exposure for me back here, it's gonna to have to give out more light and this is going to be overexposed, okay? So it's worked out the distance based on an amount of light. Now, if you've then got the flash on the camera, it will have a little chat to the lens and say, okay, I think that the subject is about a, a meter and a half away, for example. How far away are you focused lens? And the lens goes, yep, yeah, I'm focused at a meter and a half. Brilliant, we've confirmed our distance. Okay, we worked it out with light and we've confirmed it with focus distance. If the lens says, actually, I'm focused three meters away, the camera goes, oh, okay, right, we'll, uh, we'll take that on board and we'll maybe give it a bit more light. So it fires this pre-flash, it measures the light, then the mirror, if you're on a DSLR, uh, pops up. If you're on a mirrorless, obviously there's no mirror. Um, the shutter opens, the flash fires, the shutter closes, the mirror comes down if you're on a DSLR, and the exposure is done, okay? And all of that still requires the camera to be able to tell the difference between shadows and highlights, which it can't do, so it still thinks everything is a mid-tone, okay? Did everybody follow that? I'm gonna check the comments. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, uh, da, 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 anybody? Oh! I, apparently someone did get it right earlier on. Aaron Prasad, well done. Uh, you did get uh, evaluative. Sorry, I missed that. That's my bad. Um, uh, okay, so that timeline, just to make sure you've got it. Measure the ambient light. Fire a pre-flash. Remeasure the light, combined ambient and flash. Subtract ambient from combined ambient and flash. Work out what component, component comes from flash. Decide, therefore, how much light the flash needs to produce. Mirror pops up, shutter opens, flash fires, shutter closes, mirror closes, boom, exposure is done. Okay? That is your timeline to a flash exposure. Incidentally, 
that pre-flash is what causes people to blink. So you know if you've taken pictures of people, some people you get half your pictures with their eyes closed like this. It's because they see the pre-flash without seeing the pre-flash, so it's a subconscious seeing, and their eyes are sensitive to it and they blink really quickly. And the thing is, that time delay between the pre-flash and the main flash is so short that they don't have time to reopen their eyes. So you get them with that eyes closed or the, the ever so partially opened look where they look like a slight zombie, okay? It's because of that pre-flash. Um, and it's something therefore to be aware of if you've got someone that's quite um, sensitive to it. There are two ways around it. One, um, you can separate your pre-flash from your main flash um, by a longer period of time by, by using effectively a spot flash reading. Um, or you can put the flash into manual uh, and thereby not get the pre-flash, but you'd have to work out your flash powers yourself based on distance. Okay, so all of that said, all of that said, um, that's your timeline to flash exposure. We should probably get on, given that we've used 36 minutes of this live stream, with actually doing some shooting, with actually taking some pictures. So please remember, you can fire up comments, uh, questions in here. Uh, there's a few of you commenting that I can see, um, but um, uh, uh, <laughs> Tom Horan, you're lost. Demo, please. Brilliant. Okay, well, that's exactly what we're about to do. Uh, so fire up questions in here, uh, because I should be able to see them, and I will do my best to answer them. So what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to give you uh, this view again. Now, what you can see here, um, we're going to start super simply. Um, and... Um, I am also going to make sure that you can see my screen, uh, which I'm hoping is going to be over here. Uh, let's make sure everything is awake. Uh, and then uh, when... Uh, there we go. Fabulous. Everything is awake. Okay, so uh, just so that you're aware, let me just show you this. Uh, I am using EOS Utility um, in this, uh, in this uh, situation. Um, in fact, if I give you this one... no. That one, sorry. You can see I've got a cable coming out of the camera here. It's running down into my computer over this side. Uh, that's allowing the pictures to come up over here, so you're going to be able to see them. Um, it is uh, uh, also a good way of controlling the camera um, if you want remote control of the camera. We're not going to do that. I'm going to stay over here, but this is fundamentally so you can see the pictures. Okay, so the, the first thing, sorry, that I want to show you. If um, I've got this in live view shooting, um, the first thing that I want to show you about... Uh, flash is about flash location. So uh, on this live view screen um, you can see uh, that it's all black. Okay and the positioning of light, oh I appear to have moved my camera from earlier on, there we go, that'll, somewhere about there will do. Um, yeah okay so the positioning of light is crucial to the look of the scene. So I've just got an LED panel here uh, and I'm just moving it around uh, so that you can see what's going on here. I'm just moving it around the subject and by doing this I can see where I think the light should come from, what I think looks good. Okay. Now it's entirely subjective, this is the subjectivity of photography. Now what's going to happen, what could happen, notice how the, the flower is lit but the background is dark. Remember we talked about light falling off over distance? That is because there's light enough to light the subject here, but there's not enough light to hit the background back there. Yeah, now that I've moved it over, you can see what's going on. Uh, okay, but, but right now when it's here, I've got nice light on the subject, but nothing in the background. So we're actually going to have light from over this side because that's going to be our big light source. Uh, so we're going to create this sort of moody, interesting looking picture. Um, at least we're going to try. Okay, we can get rid of that now. Uh, and uh, let's come back to here. Okay. So, pre-flash. I'm going to turn off uh, some flash guns. I have got light coming from this octobox here. Okay, now this is going to be our, our main light source. In fact, I'm going to move it in a little bit. It's a very large light source and I'm working in a small space. Uh, but uh, hopefully... Um, we can we can deal with this. So let me put that just here. Now you may be wondering why on earth I've put it so damned close. Um, the reason is it's all about the size of the light source. Okay. So if 
you have a large light source, you get softer light. If you have a small light source, you get harder light. Now you'll also notice that on the front of this, uh, on the front of this uh, Octobox, I've got a grid. Uh, that's allowing me to avoid too much spill into the background. So, step one, as I told you, is I need to decide, I'm going to talk to you over here, I need to decide whether I want any ambient light in this scene or not. And in this case, I do not want ambient light in the scene. Okay, um, The ambient light in here is not that wonderful. I've got a bit of window slash door light coming in from over that side. Uh, I've got the ceiling lights turned off because that would just be horrible spots. So I'm not super interested in any ambient light. My camera is in manual. The flash is in ETTL, but my camera is in manual. So um, who was it? Tom said he wanted the... Uh, 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 da, 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 da. Tom said he wanted... Uh, Tom Horan. Yes, you wanted a demo. So what's going to happen, Tom? And I guarantee you're not going to see it. I am going to take a picture. Okay. Uh, there is no ambient light in this scene. What you can see uh, over on my screen, um, if I was to show you this, uh, is just the camera changing the exposure to try and make sure that you've got uh, try and make sure that you've got um, a view so I can see to focus. That's all it's doing. But actually, uh, it's genuinely with the settings that I'm using. You can see on the histogram here, it's going to be black. Okay, uh, and I'll prove that because I'm going to take a picture with no flash, there we go, no flash, uh, and the picture that's going to appear is surprisingly black. There we go, who'd have thought it? Now I'm using uh, ISO 100, sorry, uh, f2.8 uh, at uh, 200th of a second, that's recording zero ambient light. That means that every bit of light that's going to come into this picture next is going to be from the flash, it's going to be from this big flash here, okay? So I've just left this in ETTL. There's no flash exposure compensation uh, dialed in at all. I shall prove that to you right now. There we go. See that it's at zero. Everything's at zero. Uh, no flash exposure compensation. So put this back on the camera uh, and take a picture. Now that flash fired twice. What happened? It took an ambient light reading. It was all black. Even though it was in manual, it still did that. It fired a pre-flash. The pre-flash um, determined how much light it thought it needed, how far away from the subject it was, based on whether this is mid-tone grey, brighter than a mid-tone, or darker than a mid-tone. The light came through here, bounced off, came in through the lens, got measured in here in the camera. And what's happened, uh, if I show you the picture, is it's given us this result. Now, uh, it's not bad. I think it's maybe just a smidgen uh, too dark. Uh, I think we could bring it up just a little bit. So what I'm going to do, um, I am going to show you this view again, so you know what's going on. Uh, I'm going to push the plus minus button and I'm going to take it up by two thirds of a stop. Now, why did the camera get it wrong? That's the question, because you're all going, well, it's an ETTL, sure it should get it right. Well, it got it wrong, quote unquote, because it was expecting this to be a mid-tone. And if you look at this scene, this is not a mid-tone scene. Here's the subject, and we've got this brighter petals in the middle, this brighter area, which is going to fool the camera into thinking that it, uh, uh, um, it's going to fool the camera into thinking that it needs to give it less light. I've said, I know better. This is brighter than a mid-tone. Give it more light, okay? So, I'm going to take another picture, and what I've done, I'll, I'll switch to, to four again. So this is the picture we had. Uh, nothing's changed other than I've got plus two-thirds of a stop of flash exposure compensation, and uh, bam, we've got a brighter image. Yeah, just a little bit brighter, and in fact, if I was to look at the histogram of this now, uh, it is pretty much perfect. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I can show you that. Uh, I Maybe I can... Uh, if I was to go to, uh, let me quickly find uh, find it in DPP for you. Um, desktop. Here we go. Right. Uh, let's hide. Let's get rid of these. Uh, so here is the picture. 
um, put up in uh, edit image and if we look at this histogram um, here it is hopefully you can see in this histogram I'm going to zoom in here for you uh, that histogram we've got tiny little bit of clipping in the red channel at the high end and a tiny little bit of clipping in the blue channel uh, at the low end uh, but if we look at the overall brightness which is this top one here uh, we've got a good distribution of tones now it looks like everything's all the way to the left if we look at the scene the background is all dark this is this big spike uh, and then everything else along here is the tones in the in the tulips okay so you've got those brighter tones and darker tones okay so that's great um, let's come back to uh, here there we go uh, and we're going to start making things a little bit more complex now we know that we've got um, we know that we've got uh, um, the ability to control multiple speed lights uh, so um, since I have a variety of speed lights around here, we're going to try and make this a little more complex. So we're going to try and fill in some of these shadows because for me, um, I think this is actually quite nice. It's lovely soft light, um, but I'm going to put in just a little bit of uh, light from this side. Uh, and I think we could possibly do something with the background as well. Uh, and conveniently, uh, I have got uh, a flash gun back here, hidden around there, and I've got another one here. So uh, we may as well use them. And it's great because it gives me a chance to talk to you about the radio flash system. So you'll notice I'm, as I said, using 600EX RTs uh, and an ST3RT. There are several flash guns that have RT at the end of them. What that means is that we can use the radio transmission. Rather than relying on an optical transmission, uh, the radio transmission uh, allows us up to about 30 meters of control range. So our flash can be about 30 meters away um, from the transmitter on the camera. Um, it also means that we don't have to have line of sight. Uh, in other words, we can hide a flash gun somewhere uh, and make sure that it is um, make sure that it's not uh, visible in the scene, but still have full control of it. There are a variety of other benefits. Um, one of which you're about to see. Um, it's what's called group mode. In fact, uh, let me show you this right now. Um, and I hope you can uh, I hope you can see this. Um, there we go. So I'm going to put this here, and I'm going to try and make sure we don't have glare on the screen. That looks about it. Okay. So what you'll see here is there's a little GR. No, there, Dave. There we go. Well done. Uh, there's a little GR, and that means that we're in group mode. And in group mode, we can control up to five groups: A, B, C, D, and E, and we can have them in different modes. So you'll notice that my A group is in ETTL i.e. it's doing that whole process that we talked about before. My C group, which is going to be this one back here, I don't necessarily need that in ETTL, so I can set that to manual. That's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to turn C on. Uh, I'm in fact going to turn A off because I like to build flash setups. I don't want to just throw five flash guns up or three flash guns um, and expect it to be right. I just want to build it one by one. So uh, let's have a quick look. What's going to happen is the, the background light is going to fire. Uh, that's that one on a stand down the back here. Uh, and it's going to light the background. It's got a little bit of a grid on it. It's uh, using a, a Lasterlite Strobo grid, um, which looks like, actually, let me show you that very quickly. It's a grid like the, on the big light. Um, but it's this one here. It's just a small little uh, magnetic grid. What that does, it gives us a nice soft edged beam of light. It focuses the beam, uh, stops it spreading out too widely. Now, I'm starting with the background. So the subject's probably going to be fairly dark. Uh, let's give it a go. In fact, it should be almost a silhouette. There we go. Uh, and look at that. So we've lit the background. I'm not enormously happy with the positioning. Um, it's not far off, but there we go, let's angle it over a little bit, do another one. That's better. Okay, but I do quite like the amount of light that we've got there. We've put light in there. We're creating this bit of spotlight effect. It's falling off into the corners. Um, and if I wanted more light, I'd simply come down to my transmitter. I'd turn it up. Let's turn it up to an eighth. Uh, it's going to be way too much power. Look at that, as predicted. Uh, so let's turn it back down. Uh, we're at 30 second power. Make sure that's right. 
Perfect. Now we're going to turn group A back on here with the settings that we had before, so nothing else has changed. Um, and uh, da, da, da. boom, there we go. We're going to take the picture, and now we've combined the two. We've put the light in the background, uh, and we've put the light in the foreground, and we've got effectively the two pictures created into one. Okay, simply by controlling uh, the the amount of light coming out of the speed lights. Now there was a question, um, <laughs> Tom, who's taken a picture that's completely black by accident. Uh, uh, yes, a long long time ago, um, uh, there was. Oh, Aaron Prasad, great question. What is the use of zoom in speed lights? So the use of zoom in speed lights is uh, here. Let me come and talk to you. Uh, let me come and talk to you here. Oh, I'm bumping into my own flash. Uh, so the use of zoom in speed lights. Zo uh, speed lights can mostly zoom automatically. They zoom to match the focal length of the lens. So if you're using a wide lens, they spread light wider so that you get an even coverage across the frame. If you're using a longer lens, you don't need that super wide coverage. You're just wasting light to areas not in the picture. So it will zoom in uh, to match that focal length so that you get a more defined beam. You can use that creatively. Um, if you are taking the flash off camera, it will almost certainly default to the wide setting, which is probably about 24 mil, uh, because it doesn't know what lens you're using. It, it can't determine that, and it wants to make sure that everything is covered. But you can zoom it manually, so you push the zoom button, uh, turn the dial or, or push the left and right arrows to zoom it in, uh, to make it a more defined beam if you wanted to spotlight a particular area of your scene. Um, you get basically with that to do much the same as a grid. Um, it's just not quite as soft edged as a grid would be. Okay, so that great question, uh, and and that's the answer. Hopefully that that answered your question. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Right. Okay. So I think um, this setup was actually quite nice. Uh, I was quite enjoying this. Um, let me come back to to here. In fact, let's let's give you a bit of, of a bit of view from here, so you can see what's going on down here. And I'm gonna. Crouch down. Okay, so what we're going to do, um, I'm just going to try adding in uh, an, another light uh, and we'll see how we get on with that. I'm also going to make sure that I've got my focus exactly where I want it to be. Uh, top, top tip, guys, um, if I give you this view, you can't quite see it, but if you're shooting in live view, you've got the ability to zoom in uh, five times or ten times, uh, which means if you wanted to use manual focus, you can make sure that it is exactly where you wanted it to be. Uh, there we go, that's that. That's bang on for me. Uh, I really quite like uh, this picture, so I'm gonna give you this again. Now we've got focus where we want it. I just slightly recomposed it. But I think I still want a little bit more light. Uh, I still want a little bit more light just in here, okay? In this area of that flower, for me, it feels a little bit too dark. Now, a couple of options. I could put a reflector in, a um, bit of white paper, a bit of silver card, something like that, just to fire some light down there. But since this is a demo about flash, uh, we are going to take our uh, next speed light. That's this one here. And you'll note that this has got a very muddy um, flash modifier on it. This is um, a Lasterlite Easybox Speedlight 2, a Joe McNally edition one, uh, which means it's got his name on it. Um, which is really important um, because Joe's a god of flash. Uh, it's got a grid on the front of it. Again, same reason. It's trying to control the spill of light. Uh, the other key difference between this and the non-Joe McNally edition uh, is that because he does a lot of portraits, he likes it to be slightly softer. So it's a white interior. If you can quite see that, it's a white interior. The normal version is a silver interior. It's a little bit more specular. But what we're going to do is uh, I am going to put a little more light into... Uh, this front corner here. So I'm just going to pop this uh, onto the light stand here. There we go. Tie that down. Make sure it's nice and tight. Good. Uh, okay. And we're going to get it in quite close or as close as I can. Um, that's going to be about there. And this is group B. Uh, Dave, you do need to make sure it's not in the way of the lens. That would have been a hilariously comical mistake. In fact, let me give you this view so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, right, there we go. So I'm just going to put this down 
um, it's going to be firing just a little bit of light into this tulip in the foreground. It's group B, so what I need to do, uh, if I come back to here and show you, uh, I've, pushed, I've pushed the GR button here, uh, I've scrolled down to group B, uh, and I'm going to leave that in ETTL, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide that I want it to be uh, less powerful, obviously, than the main flash, because it's only supposed to be gentle. So I'm actually going to bring it down by two stops, okay? So two stops of negative flash exposure compensation. That's effectively the ratio between A light, the big one over here, uh, and B light, the small one here, okay? It means it should just be, fingers crossed, a nice gentle tickle uh, into the front of that light. Uh, and because I've got the grid on there, it's not going to spill onto the background, also because it's in nice and close. Uh, so let's give it a go. Uh, let's see what happens. I'll give you this view, and then I'll show you the picture. Uh, so, and there we have it. So if you remember the previous one, there was very little light uh, in, in the front of the flower. In fact, uh, here, let me just turn it off, take the picture again. That one there, uh, see how dark it is now. I turn this one on, take the picture again. I've just put some light into the center of that flower. It's not done anything to the background. Yes, a little bit has caught the, uh, the tulip in the background. Uh, I could do something about that just by changing the angle here a little, uh, making sure that it's not catching the tulip, uh, the background tulip quite so much. Um, there we go, just slightly change the angle. Uh, okay, um, and I mean, I'd be fairly happy with that. I don't know about you guys. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I did get it. Tom Douglas, was this process a heck of a lot more difficult pre-digital? Uh, it, it, it probably was, yeah, in fact, it definitely was. Um, but all the processes were still the same. I would still advocate um, if you're shooting film now, because some people still do, still build one by one, build one light, see what it does, then another, then another if you need it, uh, because one, you might find you don't need as many lights as you think you need, uh, and two, as I said before, if you put all of them up, you never know what light's coming from where. So, for example, when I put this third light in um, and I fired the shot, I could see that that little bit of extra light was spilling onto the tulip in the back left, which I didn't necessarily want. Um, I maybe, uh, you know, that was going to make it a bit too hot. So I could readjust just that single light uh, and, and get it to just where it needed to be. Uh, okay, so um, all of that said, I'm just looking to see if there are any more questions or comments coming in. Uh, anything I've missed? Um, uh, no, 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 I think, I think we're there. Okay, so what we're going to do, because we're running out of time, um, I'm just going to take a couple more pictures and I'm going to change a couple of things and talk you through what I'm doing very quickly and then we'll have a really quick recap uh, and then it will be uh, it will be game over I guess so let me let me give you this angle so you can see what's happening so um, we had that uh, we had that nice shot um, but maybe I don't want the background maybe I want the background to be a bit darker so that was group C I'm going to turn group C off um, this is what we had this is what we have without group C. Notice how the background has just disappeared. Uh, it's gone into black. What I didn't show you was if I wanted to get some of the ambient light in here, um, what I would need to do. So in this case, I turn, uh, I turn the flash off. So I've just turned the transmitter off. Uh, and I'm now going to, uh, if I come to my live view shooting so I can see what's going on and you can see what's going on, I'm going to change the settings so that we get whatever ambient light we've got here. So I'm going to make the shutter speed. I don't know that. I'm about there. Okay, so what you might be able to see, uh, if I put this up as well, to record the ambient light that's in here, I need a 40th of a second f2.8 uh, at uh, ISO 800. Uh, if I take that picture, there's going to be no flash. Uh, it's going to look basically like it does on the screen. That's there. It's quite nice, but we don't. I don't really like that background. Gradually, if I now turn the flash on, okay, we're going to put a bit more light in. I'm just going to turn the flash on exactly as I had it before, um, with the exception of the backlight. So I'm not going to have Group C on. Uh, and let me fire that. And now you'll see we've got the background. 
Colour's changed a little bit because there's a bit of spill light going over onto it. But we've also got uh, light on our subject, but we've got probably a, a little bit too much light. It's not desperate. Uh, let me have a quick look at the histogram. Uh, it's, it's close to being too hot, but not too close. So what I'm going to do, and what I want you to see, is we had those settings, okay? Remember those settings that we've got just here? 40 of a second, 2.8, 800, I've turned the flash on. I'm going to gradually get rid of the ambient light, okay? And in fact, I'm going to put the, the backlight on as well so you get a true representation with all three speed lights included. So we've got our base shot is going to be this. Okay, that's with the light in the background as well. Obviously, it's overexposed because the background was quite bright with ambient light and we've just put more light in there. So I'm going to start off by taking the ISO down. We were ISO 800. Uh, I'm going to come down to 200 uh, and we'll see what happens. There we go. Notice how the light levels come down. Uh, if I come down to ISO 100, uh, obviously because that backlight is in manual, as I change the ISO, that dramatically affects how much light there is in that backlight. But these two, the front two lights in ETTL, adjust automatically. So I'm now down to ISO 100, as you can see on the screen. Uh, I take the picture. There it is. The background's now got back to where we want it to be. And now, if I take the um, shutter speed up, we're at 40 of a second. So let's take it up a stop. We're gradually just cutting out... Uh, ambient light. Take it up another stop, we're at 160th, uh, and let's go a little bit higher. We're now at the maximum sync speed, at 200th of a second, okay? Now, what happens if I go above that? So I'm now going to go up to, we're going to go to 800th of a second. If I turn the flash off, it's going to be entirely black. Look at that. I turn the flash back on. The background's going to be dark. I can tell you that right now because we're in high-speed sync. Um, but the flowers should look much the same. What you might have heard was a beep. Uh, we're getting towards the limit uh, with these settings as to what the flash can put out. Um, but basically what's happened, and I need to explain this to you, uh, is we've gone to high-speed sync. So let me come back here to this one because I think this is the easiest one for you to see it on. What you may notice is... Uh, there is an H with a lightning bolt next to it just here, um, and that is high-speed sync. I get to that by pushing menu and then the sync button. So I've got ordinary sync and then high-speed sync. Okay. Now what is high-speed sync? Uh, it's going to be the last thing I tell you before wrapping up. Um, if I come back to here, me again. High-speed sync. Um, normally when you take a picture, the... Uh, um, the, the shutter with flash um, needs to be exposed all as one. Okay, so we have two shutter curtains uh, and they move down the frame like this. Above a certain shutter speed, you don't end up with the whole frame exposed as one, you end up with a traveling slit of light. Okay, so in theory, you can't go above the maximum sync speed. That might be 160th, 200, 320th, depends on the camera that you're using. If you want to use a faster shutter speed, so that, for example, on a bright sunny day, you can shoot wide open at f1.2 on a 51.2 if you've got one of those, um, or so that you've got complete control of your depth of field with aperture, you might need to use high-speed sync in a bright environment. High-speed sync allows you to go all the way up to the maximum shutter speed of the camera, which could be 4,000th of a second or 8,000th of a second, but what happens is the flash power comes down. Essentially, the camera... Uh, and the flash interact in such a way that the flash doesn't just fire a single pulse, it fires a long burn of light. So if this is, sorry, I was drawing a graph with my finger if that wasn't clear. Uh, instead of going bang, it goes down. Okay, so it's trying to light every stage uh, of that scene as the shutter curtains move. Uh, and that means that your flash power comes down because it can't give as much out in any given time period. It also, interestingly, means that your, shutter, uh, your flash duration is longer. So if you're trying to freeze motion, it's actually not quite as beneficial um, uh, because your shutter drag, uh, sorry, your, your um, flash duration, your T-speed is longer. Um, that may or may not be important to you. Anyway, with high-speed sync, as I say, uh, you can therefore get your shutter speed 
to be as high as you want it to be and still get the correct exposure provided you put enough light out okay uh, so you're not limited by your sync speed your maximum sync speed if you've ever shot with studio flash what you've possibly found uh, is that the um, if you've gone above your sync speed you've got like a black bar uh, along the bottom of the frame which is the shadow of the shutter curtain okay uh, and simply showing slowing your shutter speed down will will fix that problem but it's high speed sync is what the solution is um, in this situation okay so that's your high speed sync uh, remember to set it on the flash or the camera uh, and then you can use your shutter speeds as high as you want. Okay, so a quick recap. Um, just so that I'm going to making sure uh, any questions. Da, 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 da. Uh, Murray, any tips if people find the flash too bright when photographing them? Um, change the flash position. Try diffusing it. In fact, really good question. Uh, you've prompted me to tell you something else. It means we're going to run over time, uh, but I'm hoping you're you're not going to mind too much. I'm just going to move that because it's uncomfortable standing against it. Okay, try bouncing flash. So flash heads face like this, yeah, like 90 degrees. Um, this is great, but they also do this and this and this and this and even this. Okay, they point in all sorts of directions. Now, if people find the flash too bright. Um, try bouncing it. What people are now going to do almost instinctively is go, yay, let's bounce it off a ceiling. Well, for me, I've got quite a low white ceiling here. Probably work quite well with bounce flash, uh, other than the fact that when I'm holding a camera to my eye, the flash is pretty much right next to the ceiling here, which you can't quite see. Um, the trouble with that is when we're outside, as I said before, we get the light coming from above, which creates shadows under the eyes and nose and the chin. We don't like that light. So I've never understood why people then come inside and recreate it by bouncing light off a ceiling. If you could explain it to me, I'd love to know because it seems entirely counterintuitive. Um, what you're better doing, if you've got the ability, is finding a white wall and bouncing sideways. Okay, turn the flash head sideways. You're taking a, I'm taking a picture of you right now. Here we go. I'm going to bounce the light off a white wall on my left or a reflector, and it's going to come back in from the side, uh, which is going to make it lovely and soft and directional. There'll be shadow across your face, but you'll have a nice modeling to the face. It's not going to be like bright and dark. It'll just be lovely and soft. What I will say is you need to find something that's white uh, or at least light colored, not a strong color. Otherwise, you're going to put that light onto your subject. The last one is it fires backwards like this. Position yourself against a white wall, your back to a wall. Point it slightly up and over. It's going to come over your head, hit the wall, hit the ceiling, come forwards. You get a big, diffuse, soft front light. The one thing to remember when you're bouncing light from anywhere is that obviously the flash is having to travel a lot further, so it has to work a lot harder. It can take longer to recycle. And if the thing you're trying to bounce from is a very long way away, you're not going to get enough light on your subject. Uh, there we go. Hopefully that, uh, hopefully that answered your question. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, okay, no more questions. Uh, da, 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 da. No more questions. Fabulous. In which case, I am going to wrap up. Any other questions that come in now, um, I will dive into the comments afterwards and do my best to answer them. So, to, uh, to wrap up, I started off by showing you that Flash was brilliant, uh, that I absolutely love Flash and gave you some examples as to why. It's like a pocket sun that you can take anywhere with you that you're in control of. The real kicker with Flash is that you need to know uh, how much Flash you're going to use. You've got to decide between whether it's fill Flash, i.e. you're mixing Flash with ambient, uh, or whether it's Flash dominant, in which case you're not bothered about the ambient. Um, that will affect how you're going to work. We then talked about the shooting modes, P, TV, AV, and M, and what they do to flash. Uh, and I explained that in P mode, it's sometimes fill flash and sometimes flash dominant, depending on the ambient light um, levels. In TV and AV, it's going to try and do fill flash. And in M, that being M on the camera, not M on the flash, you get to choose. And it's your shutter speed predominantly that's going to determine whether you get a lot of ambient light, slow shutter speed, or less ambient light, fast shutter speed. Um, I explained about flash exposure compensation and indeed ex ordinary exposure compensation uh, in the sense that you can tell the flash or the camera, whichever one you're using, that your subject is brighter or darker than a midtone. Uh, what I didn't say that I probably should have done is when you're in fill flash, um, that flash exposure compensation is quite minimal. Think of it like a dimmer switch, 
a little bit brighter in the shadows, a little bit darker in the shadows. But when you're in flash dominant, it's crucial because if you get the amount of flash wrong, it's really, really obvious because obviously flash is everything in the scene. Um, uh, so that was your flash and ambient light exposure compensation. And if you get your ambient light exposure correct, uh, fill flash becomes a lot easier. Uh, we then talked a little bit about the radio system. I gave you a demo of photographing the tulips behind me. We talked about building your flash setup one at a time, not just turning on lots of flash guns all together. Um, I demonstrated how shutter speed affects the amount of ambient light in the scene, what ISO does, and then we talked about high speed sync and a little bit about bounce flash. Uh, and I think that was pretty much everything. Oh, we talked about size of light source as well. Bigger light source means softer light, smaller light source means harder light. Um, maybe I said that it's also how near or far it is from the subject because a big light source a long way from the subject is still hard because it's relatively smaller while a small light source close to the subject is softer because it's relatively larger. Uh, and that, I think, was about it. I think that was pretty much everything that we talked about. So uh, I'm going to dive into the, uh, the comments and see if there were any questions that I missed. Other than that, I'm going to say thank you so much, everyone, uh, for sitting in and watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope, um, I hope it was maybe a little humorous. Hopefully it was informative uh, and you're feeling a little bit more confident about using Flash. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing some of your pictures taken with Flash uh, over this period while we're in lockdown. Just because we're in lockdown or whatever version of lockdown we have uh, doesn't mean we can't be creative. Um, so have a look around your house, even find some dying tulips, um, which is what I found, to try and create some nice pictures. There's so many things around the house once you open your eyes and have a look. Um, I think all that remains for me to say is stay safe and healthy, stay well, uh, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, once this lockdown is over in a real life uh, workshop um, sometime when I come over to Dublin next. Uh, other than that, thank you very much everyone. Um, as I say, stay safe and well, and I will see you all at the next one. That said, last thing, if there is anything that you want us to cover, uh, any other workshops that you'd love to see me do, um, uh, I don't know if you wanted to know, uh, oh, it could be all sorts of things, focusing, menus, printing, workflow, software, whatever, all sorts of things. If there's anything Canon specific that you would like me to cover, uh, then again, hit up the comments and we will talk to the powers that be uh, and maybe they'll let us do some more, possibly. Uh, anyway, I'll see you all soon, guys. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.